This is a harmonica, 10 hole diatonic D harmonica, 30 bucks from your local music store. This is physics. This is biology. Now, if I put the physics and the biology together, I get something else. Ready? The blues. So I couldn't resist that. That's just a, a fun example of how um, taking the physics of air moving over metal reeds to get notes, plus the biology, which is tiny changes in my mouth and throat, which take years to learn, although it didn't sound like it, gives you something new, something cool, which is, in that case, the blues. And my talk really is about how we can get something cool by combining physics and biology. So. The public and the private sectors over the past 40 years have spent hundreds of billions of dollars on biomedical research. The work that's been done using those funds has been mainly focused at the molecular scale, looking at things like DNA and proteins. Now that money, huge amounts, has been incredibly well spent because over these past few decades, our knowledge of life at the molecular scale has been completely transformed. And we've learned huge amounts about the aw awesome molecular machinery that runs life at that scale. The rationale for looking at molecules is that those are seen to be really the place to start if you want to develop new drugs. And new drugs would then be hoped to make an impact on human health. Now, I think disappointingly for, for biologists, the translation of that molecular discovery to real impact on major human diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's has really been rather modest. So the purpose of my short talk today is really just to try and bring a little bit of physics thinking to this translation gap, which is currently like this, to ask how can we narrow it so that we can actually make a difference with all of that wonderful science on human health. And I'll be using, I can say, my three maxims, because they are mine, these three maxims behind me to help frame what I'm going to say. So first of all, physics does not equal biology. I, as a physicist, am absolutely not uh, suggesting that we apply the laws of physics to cells, tissues, organisms. That would be ineffective and superficial. Because all living things around us are a product of four billion years of evolution that has occurred over the whole surface of planet Earth. And that awe-inspiring process over that huge amount of time has embedded lots of contingency and complexity at every scale of life. And the laws of physics, the theories of physics that we have, were simply not designed with that in mind. Laws of physics were, were formulated to address non-living things like heat, light, matter, and have been very successful. Now, I should just stress, though, that biology and life obeys the laws of physics, as does everything that we know of, but it's not explained by the laws of physics. So it's not physics per se that we need, it's physics approach combined with deep biological insight and experiment that I think can really be a very powerful way forward. So let me talk about the physics approach. In the popular media and in 
many people's minds, they think of physics in terms of particles and cosmology because of television programs and what looks cool. But actually, most of modern physics has really nothing to do with particles at all. Most of modern physics is concerned with systems of very large numbers of particles. And physicists have actually become terribly good at understanding systems of particles. So good that they've actually changed our world numerous times in understanding those systems. I'll just give you some examples. So physicists, in trying to understand gases, steam, created thermodynamics, which enabled steam engines to be perfected, and the Industrial Revolution was then fully powered. Physicists created fluid mechanics. One example of the use of that would be to design very large aircraft, which now fly millions of people safely around the globe, which has changed our world, changed the way that we understand each other. Physicists invented a field called solid state, which was then used to understand silicon and create silicon chips. And as you all know, that powered the new revolution, which is the information revolution, which has changed our lives yet again. All of those systems, whether it be the steam, the air moving over an aircraft wing, the inner workings of a silicon chip, those systems and the way they're understood in physics re relies very little on the molecular and atomic components. Very little information is needed at that scale. The understanding we have comes from abstract and quite conceptual theories that sit a few scales up. And those abstract ideas, when honed with experimental data, have been the powerful recipe that, that physicists have used. We often speak of emergence in physics as this concept that to understand the system often doesn't really require detailed knowledge of the components of the system. And so I'm really arguing here that we need to bring this concept of emergence more into biology, and that's contained in my second maxim here. Small does not imply fundamental, and vice versa, fundamental does not imply small. Now, um, to carry on with this, uh, this argument, the way that the biology community may see their challenge is not so much in moving away from molecular details, but it's more in terms of coping with molecular details. And this is the area of big data. Because of technology, we've become tremendously good in the life sciences at collecting data about genes, collecting data about proteins, and creating some of the biggest data sets the world's ever known. And the big data challenge is how does one manage such hu huge amounts of data? My view is that big data is an incredible resource, absolutely invaluable, but I believe its true power comes from being confronted with these conceptual theories that I've spoken about from physics. I think that if one tries to navigate big data without a conceptual framework, it's a bit like setting off into the Pacific Ocean without a compass or a map on a very cloudy day. <laughs> and to, to try and illustrate that last point, let's go back to thermodynamics, which is one of the examples I've mentioned already. Now, between 1820 and 1860, pioneers such as Nicholas Carnot, Lord Kelvin, and James Prescott Joule created thermodynamics and delivered to civilization a complete theory of heat encapsulated in three simple laws and they also created new concepts such as thermodynamic temperature, entropy. They did that really with conceptualization continually challenged by ingenious experiments. And it is fun to, to think how would they have coped if they had access to big data. 
So let's imagine they were thinking about the gas in this room as a thermodynamic problem. What would big data look like? Well, if you think about the size of a sugar cube, which is about a cubic centimeter, if we imagine a cubic centimeter of the gas in this room, that would contain 30 million, million, million molecules traveling on average at about 1,000 meters per second. And every trillionth of a second, you would have innumerable collisions. If you could, by magic, take that tempestuous molecular chaos in that sugar cubed volume of air into a big data set, go back to 1820 and give Carnot, Kelvin, and Joule that data, would it have helped them? I think they would have been amazed and awestruck by that data. I think they may have actually dedicated their lives to trying to understand that data. I don't know whether they would have arrived at the laws of thermodynamics and the concept of entropy. Now, there are a number of biologists in the audience here. I recognize some of them, my friends and colleagues. I think a very strong argument against what I'm saying from a biological point of view is that the molecular complexity of, in biology is far greater than the molecular complexity that we see in physical systems like gases or silicon chips. And they would argue that we have to understand that biomolecular complexity in order to understand the complexity of life, whether it be tissues or organisms. That may be true, but then again, it may not be true. And I think we have to hold both of those possibilities in mind. And therefore, I do believe we need to vigorously pursue this other avenue of the physics style, the abstract conceptualization, but continually challenged by experiment. And a further argument I would give in support of that approach is the third maxim, which is that simple does not imply obvious. All of the laws of physics in their myriad forms are actually quite simple in their formulation, but their predictions, the ramifications, can be arbitrarily rich and arbitrarily complex. I think a wonderful example of that really is the paper that Albert Einstein wrote in 1905 on the special theory of relativity. You may not be aware of this, but his whole theory is actually encapsulated in two simple rather innocuous looking sentences, two postulates. But when you take those innocuous looking postulates and you actually turn the handle of logic and use mathematics to work out the predictions, what you suddenly find is that time is not an absolute. You actually have to talk about space time and that mass and energy are in fact the same thing. And so Einstein's very simple innocuous theory changed the way we think about the universe and essentially predicted the existence of nuclear energy. So I'm a great believer in simplicity. And it doesn't have to mean that things are obvious. I think simple theories are the bedrock of science because they're comprehensible to our rather limited human minds. And if we give up on simplicity, it means that we're really giving up on ownership of science. And I think scientists then become rather humble technicians that feed data in to supercomputers mm -hmm. and receive wisdom out as some kind of reward. And that's not the kind of science that I think we need to be aiming for. So I'm appealing for a search for the laws of biology, which would be joining forces between physics and biology because they both have so much to offer to this. And as a final remark, how are we going to do that? It's all about education. It's all about not making people like myself, I suppose, because I was trained as a physicist in a very linear way. Um, a physicist, no matter how bright and able, will make very little impact in biology if she is untrained in biology and doesn't have that intuition and knowledge. And likewise, a biologist will not be able to really capitalize on the approaches that I've been speaking of if they're unaware through their disciplinary training of the really profound advances in systems thinking and physics over the last hundred years. So I think it's my job and the job of my colleagues to make sure that the new generation of scientists gets a proper broad education across both science and arts in order 
to bring far more to their work as scientists. And I hope if we can do that in a generation from now, those people can really create the miracle of the biomedical revolution and take all of the wonderful things we know and have those things make a huge impact on human health. Thank you so much.